if there's anything you're going to do, whether you're a novice feeder angler, you're new to watching a tip, um, if you take it seriously, or if you are in the middle of a feeder fishing campaign that's completely changing how you'd normally sit and watch a float, fish shallow on pole, then you must visit here. And here I am at Southfield Reservoir in Doncaster. That is the Aaron Calder Canal. As it branches off to the left, that's New Junction Canal. As it carries on up there, that's the Aaron Calder navigation that we all know. This is where it feeds in. Further down, on what we know as the sort of east bank, there's another inlet as well. It's a lot shallower. This one's a lot deeper. And between here and that part of the res down there, it's partitioned off with what used to be a bank. It's corroded away over years. I believe fish traffic can get over either side. However, these pegs on what I know to be the south bank or the wood pegs is what we all know, always chuck up bigger weights. Not every time, but majority of the time, this is where the weights come from couple of pegs down on two and three I think last year they were over 100 pound bag not so long ago 90 odd pound won it just off another one of these local pegs on Woodside and I think it's because there's more access for bigger fish to get in here than there is further down yesterday our very own Tommy Pickering won off this peg with 50 odd pound of bream absolutely smashed it to bits there were some weights that weren't far behind him from further down but it just kind of secured my theory that these pegs always do a lot better than the others. So today, I've chosen to come up, have a pleasure session on here, and use my regular approach mix that I normally use, skimmer bream dark, um, thought I just saw a fish top there, oh, that's a green. So today, I've come here to use my regular mix, which is my go-to mix, skimmer and bream dark, had a big fish top in front of me. I think it were an hybrid that. Skimmering Bream Dark and GG Green. I've also got some Skimmering Bream Natural that I might mix up. I think it might be a bit too early yet for natural colours. But I've got pinkies, casters, worms, and a few maggots. So when we get set up, I've got a 50 meter line and I've also got a 35 meter line. I'm going to get set up, and today you're going to join me on a bit of feeder fishing. Right, so, right, get to your peg, get your initial gear out there that you want to be putting your, your bait on, your rod rest and everything, and that's it. Worry about everything else after. You want to get your bait sorted first, and then when that's sorted, you've got somewhere for it to go. Skimmer and Bream Dark, GG Green. I have got some Skimmer and Bream Natural. I don't know if I'm going to use it. I'll see how day goes. I just think it's still, we're still in them sort of colours that mean a dark mix is what they're going to be wanting. So first of all, I'm going to do two parts to one. Now normally I do two parts to one, two parts skimmer and green dark to one part GG green. This time I'm going the other way around. So although I'm not going straight onto a natural colour yet, I'm confident that even if I fish GG green straight, I'm going to still catch plenty of fish. But I just want that tinge of darkness adding to it, purely because it's still a, not loads of colour in water, but it's still quite clear. I can see most of the way out just here. So I'm not just going to go in completely jet black. I've also got some little bees seen up micro pellets. Uh, I want to put them in a pellet wetter and just make them up as normal. That's no problem at all. I'll do them first. So get a pellet wetter. Get your pellets. I'm going to bang all them in. Because they're going to sit in a separate tub and they're going to be filtered into my mix as and when. Get a bowl full of water. Then, when you put your pellets in, always give them a bit of a shake first, because when they're manufactured from any company, and through transportation, just having them in and out of your bag, some of them 
do tend to chip into little bits. And if I put my hand under there, you can feel it falling out. They're just like little bits of crumb from when they've been bagged up. So get a few of them out, then you want to dunk it straight in to your pellet wetter like that a couple of times. Just make sure they all submerge. There we go. And then you want to get straight on with your mix. Now I'm not bothered how long it takes for them to soak. If I want them to cling to a method feeder, 20 to 30 seconds, and then I'll add water all day just to make sure that they're keeping the same sort of viscosity and the tacky enough. When they go into a ground bait mix, they can be completely soggy all the way through to me. So they can stay in there for as long as it as long as I need to. Right, so mixing up my ground bait. I'm gonna do two parts to one, DG green. So what I'm gonna do is fill it up once with skimming and bream dark. Like I say, it's a big old venue here and uh, plenty of feed can go in. So one of them, like that, to two parts, GG green. So, one, like that, and then two. Now, sometimes I'll add my water before I mix it up. Sometimes I'll mix it up and add my water. Because of how finesse your feeder fishing tends to need to be on here as opposed to a commercial, I'm going to mix it up dry and then add my water after. So just get your hand in, get a good old mix up. Again, if you've got a bad back like I have, a drill would be ideal, but I just, I don't like having a drill in my kit. I don't like carrying it. I only use one when I need to put a bloody shelf up. And uh, I just think it makes a lot of noise on bank and you just don't need it. So, but that's my opinion. I do it by hand. So there, got majority colour there. Pretty much as we expect, because it's two parts to one GG green, it's quite light in a green colour. Now, instead of using lake water again, I've now got something completely different to lake water and tap water. If I take my pellets out, they've been soaking long enough. I can give them a quick shake over here. Chuck them on the floor. And now I've got a mix of water there that's got all the flavouring from the pellets, a few dust particles in there. And I can use that. So if anything's going to give me an edge and it's going to be the water or the liquid I use to mix my bait, I can use that. It's no problem at all. So all I'm going to do is for a good offering in. When you do this a lot, you know how much it takes. Just want to mix it up. Make sure you get your fingers all the way down to the bottom. And again, use a bucket for it. Try not to use a square ground bait bowl. Or a square tub because it's just not going to happen. We're going to get trapped in corners, and in corners are a square bowl, you're either going to get dry, dry mix, or you're going to get too much wet mix, and it can interfere with your mix later on in the day as well. And again, you don't need much water this from Revolution Baits, it, it clings onto just enough water it needs and. It's also a mix that holds water all day as well. So you don't have to worry about it drying out too quickly. You can still add water to it where you need to. Every mix will dry out eventually. But this one so far, our talk mixes I've used over years, this one is absolutely spot on. Especially when using a dry mix through a window feeder, for example. And today, that's exactly what I'm going to be using on here. Right, there we go. All mixed up, make sure it's all churned over underneath like that. Absolutely no problems at all. Right, now that's done. What I'm not going to do is, I'm not going to shove all this through a riddle and have all lot in 15 different tubs on my side tray. I want to riddle just enough to fill two tubs and the rest of it can stay behind me. I can cover it up on the bank. If this sun decides to come through clouds or it rains, I've got it out of the way and I can come back to it later on. Later on. And not only that, but I've got a mix that's untampered with. And when I've one that I'm going to use on my side tray, and another one which is going to be just straight mix out of here, so I can chop and change where I need to. If I make up one big mix straight away and it's not what they want, I've pretty much stuffed it and I've got to start from scratch again. So, 
get a riddle. Plenty on. Like that. Just riddle it through. Nice and easy. Got a three mil riddle, so not too fine, but just enough to break down any, any of them big sort of dry lumps you get in all your mix. There we go. Or just enough like that. Get a bang. And then let's get another load in like that. Again, if, if you push too much onto a riddle straight away, it's just going to be a nightmare trying to riddle it. You have two and a half kilos of ground bait on at a time. It's just going to be a nightmare trying to reel it. Um, get it in. That's it. Put a bit too much on that time. So get your second, second lot. Whatever motion tends to work for you. Circular motions, roll backwards and forwards, side to side, and then just push it through just to help it. Like so. And there we go. And again, whilst you're pushing it through your riddle, you're compacting it against all rested particles that have either took on more water than rest or some that haven't took on as much as others. And all you're doing just by riddling it, you help mix it a little bit more as well. Get a riddle a bang. And that's it. That mix can go out there, over there, out it way. And when you get your two bait tubs like this, and then all you want to do is go straight in. So one of them, either one, is going to be used for my baiting up process. And the other one, is going to be my lean mix which will sit on my side tray like that and what I can do is I can make a mix out of one pellets, maggots, casters, worms, grout, everything you can think of that you want in it that you know works I can put five or six of them out depending on weather you can put 10, 15, 20 out I put five or six of them out onto a line and then I can use that to start fishing with if then I need to add particle or I need to remove particle, I can then start another mix in a different tub with less particles in it. I don't want to sit there all day picking maggots and casters out of a ground bait mix. So that's them. And you've got your pellets. All you want to do with these, don't worry about shaking too much water off. Whack them straight into a tub like that. And then you've got them ready to go. Whilst you're setting up and finishing the rest of your gear, they'll be taking on that little bit more water you get a bit of air getting to them and then if you need to add any more to them when you've set up or halfway through setting up you can do you don't want at the whistle or all in or start your session to start chucking out on a mix that's not quite ready yet so that's my grind bait mixes i'll get rest of my gear set up and we'll get chucked in oh me back <sighs> all right so got my two mixes so they're both exactly the same as i mentioned before when i mixed them up Pinkies, casters, and some maggots, and micros. So, not complicated whatsoever. I've also got some worms as well. Not to feed. Um, I, I don't like feeding worms at better times, never mind when it's still a bit cold. So, what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to show you how we do this first initial mix. So, this is what I'm going to bait up with, and it's what I'm going to feed on those first initial casts. Probably that first hour or so, this is going to be my mix. So, a few pinkies. And I mean a few, not a lot. Probably even less maggots. Pellets, massive believer that bream and skimmers love pellets like that. I'm not even going to bother with any casters. That there is it. Now I'm not going to bother mixing it all the way down into that bottom layer. I'm just going to mix it enough so that I've got a nice mix on top with a few particles in it. What I don't want is to absolutely fill that What I don't, sorry, I've got a swan behind me. What I don't want is, is to absolutely fill it with particles straight away. The ground bait alone, and I've tried this plenty of times, just by feeding ground bait, and just with a hook bait on and feeding no particles whatsoever, just on a tester session, 
I get fish in my swim just off that ground bait mix. So I'm gonna put a few particles in there, and I mean a few, hardly any. That means when I go out on those first initial casts, when fish start moving over that feed early, I have got more chance of hooking up than I have if I've got twice as many particles in there. Simply because your fish are gonna come into your swim wary. They won't get comfortable on that straight away. So I want a mix that not only draws them there, but it's gonna give me a good chance of hooking up nice and early. That way, if I get a few early fish, I can then scope where my mix is going after that. I can fish pinky on hook, double white or double red on here seems to work really well. Caster, I can either plug a few of them into a window feeder if I need to, and then micros, I can add them in as and when. Feeder wise, I'm gonna bait up with a rocket and then fish a cage window. Solids are absolutely spot on if it's really hard and you don't want a lot of feed going out in your swim quickly, but cage feeder tends to do really well on here. And uh, I've also got some just standard cage options as well. Put my rig on my rod. It's just a standard pattern oster, just your everyday helicopter rig. Eight pound shot leader to 010 braid on my reel. I've then got two float stops. These on here can determine how far I want my hook length away from my feeder. So I can just slide them up and down if I need to. Put my feeder onto my onto the end of my shot leader. I never put it on there to bait up or cast out. This also means that it becomes a versatile rig. I can slide a float stop up there like that. I can bring this clip down and I can actually fish a feeder on this clip as a running feeder rig and put a hook length onto this end and just fish a traditional style running feeder rig. Nice and versatile, really easy to do. Just a couple of Preston stops, float stops and, um, and a medium snap link swivel like that on either end. Nice and simple, really strong. Distance master, I've gone for a 3.8, 80 gram. So I've not got the 120s out. I'm certainly not looking for distance out there, but I am looking for accuracy. So 35 meters to 50 meters. I want to make sure that I'm getting accurate casts. I ain't got a wind on at all today, but it can turn from one extreme to other here at Southfield. So one minute it can be nice flat calm and the next minute it can be absolutely seafront. So me and my swan friend, we're going to get some bait chucked out. And then we are going to chuck out, start a stopwatch, and uh, and see how we progress on to those first few initial bites. Should we get any? But I'm confident. Not chucked any bait out yet. Nice dead starter of session. This never fished on this peg before either. So peg one. Tommy did well on here yesterday, and um, yeah, hoping for a few bites. Right, I've positioned you there simply so you might be able to see bites a little bit easier. And also, I don't want to be sat dead on. I've got loads of water out in front of me. And with this being peg one on the wood side, it'd be wrong for me to chuck straight in front like that where none of that gets pegged up there. So I've also got options to chuck all around here, which means I can actually turn my rod that way and I can fish at that angle out there, which I imagine is going to be shallow. But I've got a lot of water in front of me and I want to make sure that I'm sat in a position most of the day where I can utilise as much water as possible. So I'm going to go out with those... First initial rockets, again, this mix is just about getting a bit of feed out there on that 35 metre line. With just not as much particle in it to start with. The fish aren't going to come straight into your swim from metres away because you've got loads of particle in your feed. They're going to come into your swim for the commotion and because of that attractant from your ground bait straight away. So, got a marker in front of me. Everyone will know it's tower. It's actually a... Uh, a uh, power pylon like a small it's in a gap in some trees absolutely spot on for a cast so line it up right on that one there we go with the clip follow it down and then onto my rest not touching it i have tried this so many times by compressing ground bait into a feeder as hard as i can and doing it really lightly in a tank at home in pond i know full well if you leave that five seconds and then pull it back and shake it, it's not empty. It might feel empty. You might leave it 10 seconds and pull it back. You are not empty in that feeder. You need to press it in with a nice medium press. Enough so that it gets it down to the bottom of lake, reservoir, canal, whatever. That's the important bit, getting it down there. However long you have to wait in order to bring your feeder back without drawing all your bait back as well, it doesn't matter. It's worth just waiting that little bit longer so you know full well that that feed is empty. If I start pulling that back now as quick as I can, 
if I'm going to be feeding anywhere that's not where my feeder is, I don't want it to be any closer to me. I want it to be further out. Because if fish are going to change mood and change direction, they're going to go that way and not necessarily this way. You always get about 20, 25 seconds. And you want to lift it up, reel down to it like that, get a nice tight line, and then you want to draw it back nice and quickly. You're still going to move your feed. However, you're not going to move as much as what you don't actually see. That's not my reel making that noise, it's a bird behind me. When I'm reeling, sounds like it needs a good oil. Swing your feeder in. And again, this mix, along with a few pinkers and maggots, just the mix alone with those pellets, that's what keeps them grubbing about. Got a lovely swan in front of me, cleaning everything up that's falling off. Again, punch one out, hit the clip and the treat, and just drop it. And all you're doing is, oh, I'm over his back. And all you're doing is, you're just waiting. Not very deep here at all. Probably about four and a half, five foot where I'm fishing at a guesstimate. Um, but more so from what a lot of other people have been saying, it's not very deep or it's quite shallow. Feeders at bottom, it's now taken on water. Just like we've seen with method feeders with pellets, ground bait, it compresses into a more secure substance. Therefore, I don't want to be drawing it back really quickly. You will get some mixes that are a really fluffy mix that will loosen up on cast as it hits the surface and makes its way down, that they are probably ready to draw back straight away. What I don't want to do is start pulling my feeder back after a couple of seconds of it being out and draw a full feeder back and then empty two or three feet this way. Because my hook length, you've got to remember this, when your feeder lands, your hook length is nine times out of ten going to land behind it. So you don't want it to be this side of your feeder. So make sure you leave it enough. Reel up your slack like that, point your rod towards your feeder, grab all your spool, get a couple of them. And now that feels like there's nothing in it whatsoever. Which goes against what I'm saying to be fair, because even when you really do draw it back as hard as you can, after just five seconds, it can feel empty. But you try doing that and you will see a difference, 100%. And even if you don't feel a difference at all, you've still got that peace of mind that you've left that little bit longer and you are going to have more feed in your swim. So again, get your marker, get your clip, come down like that. There you go. You've got to remember as well that when you're baiting up, you don't want to be doing it any different as to how you'd be casting. Because when you then go over on that cast afterwards, you want to be landing pretty much in the area of feed all the time. I don't know what I'm feeling, but I'm getting a lot of vibrations through my box. I don't know what it is, but my box is absolutely vibrating the life out of me. I've got loads of fish in front of me here, only small things like that. So just bear that in mind if you ever come up here and you're having a bad day on feeder. There's loads of little fish in front of me and not tiny blades either. Loads of really small fish. So it would be ideal for a whip. So again, reel down like that, get a nice tight line, empty it. Loads of fish in front of me. They're small ones. I think a perch has just chased a load out because 15 million tiny little roach have all just surfaced with fear of God in their eyes. So again, just load up that feeder again. You don't need to compress it really hard, even more so with it being a shallow venue, you really don't need to force it in. To shallow, to shallow venue, we in a second, that feeder is going to be on late bed. Now I've now got Mr. Swan right in my casting line. There we go. Beautiful. Right over him. If I were a swan, I wouldn't just sit in everyone's way all the time. So again, shut your rod down on your rest. Don't move the feeder. I've, we've seen on underwater videos on Guru and a few others, and there is loads. If you search, there's loads, especially obviously there's loads of overseas anglers doing loads of underwater filming, especially carp anglers. Using really, and normally when they're fishing really deep venues, they're really, using really high end 
recording equipment so it's really clear so um always just bear that in mind when you're casting you're doing all these flicks and these yo-yo tricks with your reel and line just don't do it it's an extra sort of 20 30 seconds just waiting for your line to sink or even aiding it without doing all these special whips and everything you just don't need to do it i get it if you're catching fish quickly but just bear it in mind when you're feeder fishing because all these little whips and that and what have you as soon as the feeder takes on a little bit of water and starts breaking down you only have to move it an inch your feeder will move an inch towards you but all your bait will move six inch either side of your feeder just leave it really still what's happening if anyone else has ever sat on peg one at southfield and they get really loads of vibrations through your box let me know box is going crazy and these distance masters as well as being great for casting distance and and accurately they bang on for emptying a feeder because the really stern stiff rods there's so many fish in front of me really stern stiff rods so that emptying that feeder at a distance you ain't got to worry about much stretching line or braid when your rod is that responsive to getting your feeder off at bottom again get my marker get my clip like that and again want it in about a, a two to four foot area because you got to remember that when you put those first initial few casts in that's not it you're then going to be baiting up on every cast anyway and hopefully if you get your mix right and you start catching a few fish not necessarily early but start getting them regularly you'll be casting in can you see that like a six ounce roach in front of my keep net you get um you get a nice bed of bait built up just with casting between fish anyway so if it starts to quieten down or starts to really speed up with fish and you're getting loads of liners but you know there's loads of fish in your peg sometimes the theory is to hold off feeding so they can clear up what's there to make the way towards your bait but sometimes if they're in a feeding zone you just want to bang that little bit more in and you'd be surprised how much of a difference it can make so again reel down to your feeder you don't want to move it at this point lock your reel up just empty it and now there's no resistance there whatsoever on that just reeling in nice and easy now now that feed is out there Not going to bother feeding that long line. I'm just going to concentrate on this one line to start with. Normally, in a match situation, I'd bait up both and then go straight in. But, I've not been on this peg before. I've not even fished on this side at res before. So, everything's a bit new to me. Now, hook length. Going for a size 14. Uh, a two foot hook length. Well, it's actually... 25 inch for a two foot hook length uh, to 013. It's not too heavy and it's not too light. And I've got plenty of other options as well. Should I have problems cracking off or big fish problems, which I don't think I will. I've had massive fish out on 013. Going with a size 14 because I've seen size of fish that do come out of here. And I know that they're going to be big bait fish. I don't want a big bait fish to be wanting double pinky on hook but not hooking up i need plenty of hook showing preston reflow power nice strong stuff one of them and then my rig is there so this is my helicopter rig there on my uh, main line which is my shot leader that goes down to my window feeder at the bottom i've then got a two foot hook length which I can even adjust how far I want it from the feeder by pulling up my stops and I can have my hook length really close to my feeder like that by pulling it back up again but I always start with it pretty much about an inch or two away from feeder it just helps helps get away any tangles on cast or even going fish but normally when you do hook into a big bream it'll just draw that stop back down towards feeder again anyway plenty of ways to set it up that works for me very versatile just not a lot of working parts to it either so no loops wherever you've got a loop in your line you've got to remember that you won't get tension on it straight away one the line will stretch and two well wherever you've got a loop the loop will close before it tightens up 
So I've gone for a rig which is completely loopless and the only loop I've got is a tiny 10 mil loop in the end of my hook length. I don't like having big 15, 20 mil loops because again, I know it doesn't make a lot of difference, but when you pull that, I'm closing the loop before I actually get the tension I want. So a nice loopless rig. What I want to do is, nice easy bait to start with. Look for a double red. One through head. One through tail. That way, it won't helicopter up and tangle me on way in. It's live bait. They're not dead maggots either. And um, it also means I've got a lot of space in gaping milk as well for a hooking a fish. And then I'm going to put a couple of maggots in my mix. Line my feeder first so they don't all crawl out through the holes. And then just dunk in my maggots. And cap it off with ground bait. Like that. So that'll sink to the bottom. Milk bait will be sat there like that. And it means that I'm nice and close to that feed area every time. So I'm going to go back over. Those, I've, those five I've just put in. And see how long it takes for the first one. There we go. So straight down on my rest. Like that. Now, start my stopwatch pretty much straight away. Not waiting ages for it to sink like a method feeder on a deep venue. That rig is now live, so my stopwatch wants to be stopwatch wants to be as well. Stopwatch goes down next to me, so I'll keep an eye on that. And again, it's pretty flat. I'll put it there, and I can tighten my line as that bow's straightening up. I don't want to be dunking my rod under and doing all these magic tricks tightening my line. I want to be watching for liners pretty much straight away. If I'm going to get any disturbance on my tip on this first cast, it's going to be from fish leaving swim or fish feeding heavily quite early on. And I want to be watching that. I don't want to have my rod under water for the next 30 seconds waiting for a bite because I might miss everything I need to see straight away. Because normally if you're not getting any indications in that time but you've baited up the same as you normally do, it's because the fish just aren't there. You don't want to be baiting up a massive area for them to come in. It'd be like serving a 50-man buffy for just 10 people. There we go. 4 minutes 50. We into the first one. Don't feel like a big fish. Might just one of them decent-sized skimmers. And again, I don't know what's in front of me. So I want to keep my rod nice and high. I'm not going to play it low. I'm going to keep it nice and high when I'm bringing it in. I don't need to worry about any running fish either, but I'm just going to loosen my clutch up anyway, just in case I get any big knocks. I want to make sure that because I'm fishing braid, that they've got at least a little something to take back should they need it. But nice early fish, four minutes in. That's exactly what we need. Loads of confidence in this mix. Whether I two to one it one way or other, GG Green or Skimmer and Bream Dark. Them seen up micro pellets, some little bees pellets. Just a few pinkies and a few maggots. Like I said before, that example just putting far too much feed out there for not a lot of fish. It can be ideal on right venue, but I just believe here and most of the reservoirs that I fish, it's just not the way forward. A lot of these fish in here, they'll, they'll feed up and they'll just move on. That's catching right to my right hand side. And I've got a lovely big old tree in water. There we go. Big plodding fish. So again, I'm not towing him in either. I'm just using rod pressure against him, that's all. There's so many fish in my peg that when I'm drawing this bream back towards me, all these small roads are all darting out my peg. So again, just using, using weight at rod and just guiding him in. Lovely breathing. Lovely fish. If you're going to start applying wrong pressure now, it's going to be at this moment. Because you've got your fish at an angle underneath your rod and you're no longer pulling to the side, you're pulling up. 
So still try and keep your fish nice and low. Put your net out. And when he's ready, like that. Oh, he's gone again. Take my time with him. I'm not in a rush to get him in. Definitely a bonus fish. I said yesterday, Mr. Pickering would have been rubbing his hands together, pulling this peg out at bag from results I've seen on here. And there you go. So rub down. Nice early fish. Oops, absolutely, absolutely spot on in the mouth. Get that out for him. Just want to hook him up there. Yeah, nothing complicated. All this talk about chop worm and the particles and draining it. Just don't believe it's the way forward. But ah, nice early fish to start with. Probably about three pound, three and a half pound him. Not a massive fish, but four minutes in. That's absolutely spot on. So I'm going to chuck him in keep net and get another one. So again, double red on hook, not dead, alive. And go back into my mix. Literally, there's probably four or five extra maggots and pinkies in this mix in my feeder. All I'm going to do is fill it up, get a nice good press. I'm not bothered if I reel that in after a two minute fish and it's all still in there. That's the idea of it. I'll reel up, get my marker, come back on my cast. There we go. Straight down onto my rest. I've got quick drag as well on these intensities so I can adjust my line if I lead too nice and quickly. There we go. So that rig is now at bottom. My feed is taken on water. My hook length is live. So I can reset my stopwatch, straight back in for another one. So all these little knocks could just be fish feeding around my feeder, picking up all them loose offerings that I've put out baiting up and that are coming out my feeder, being wafted about by fish's tails and just water disturbance. And fish are just moving around, picking up bit by bit. And every now and again, they'll just bump into your line or your feeder. There's another one. And that's where you get your line bites from. And I think that is fish on, and it is. So nice and steady, and that's all it is. 10 minutes exactly, that bite. That's another nodding breed in that one. That's all you've got to think about. So every time you're getting all these little dinks and knocks, you don't want to be putting off the fact that it's fish feeding all quick, you need to change your mix. It's not. Fish around your feeder, and all they're doing is they're just picking up all your loose offerings. This is what I went back to. This is what I'm, so I'll go back to what I said at start. If I absolutely douse my ground bait mix full of particle, emp, pellets, loads of pinkies, my casters, absolutely fill it up, I could be waiting for that first bite for 45 minutes. By that point, 20 minutes in, my fish might have fed up and they might already be thinking about moving off onto bloke's peg next to me. I have fished this mix before with nothing in it, completely straight. All day we just double red on hook and I have caught loads of fish. Their nature is just to move along constantly. So again, if you're fishing with a long rod as well, get a nice long land in the handle. Because when you lift your fish up with a long rod, it comes up further out. If I had a seven foot rod, lifting my rod up it would draw my fish towards me. So rod down. He's another decent fish, a bit smaller than the last one, I think. He's probably two and a half pound, three pound him. Not a massive fish. Hook nicely. Got loads of maggots. Say he had four maggots falling off him then. He only had two on hook, so he's definitely had his head down. So I'm chuck him in there. So fish number two. And if you take into, time, into account the time it's took to catch him, took 14 minutes to get two bream. There we go. Straight down onto my rest like that. 
and I've got a massive bow in my line. I just punched that a little bit harder that time, which it's not bad. If you think about how far my tip is round now, I'm probably about six inch further than what I were. So all I need to do, I don't need to touch my rod or anything. I am down to my clip on here. I can adjust that a little bit more, but I can just get my rest and just swing it round like that. There we go. And my precision rest, as my braid is sinking, I'm also going to be clawing a bit of that line back as well. So my rig's in, it's live. Reset my stopwatch because I know it's on bottom. My hook length is now fell in all that feed. And I'm now in a position where my rig is live, ready for a fish to take it. So that's when I want to be starting my stopwatch. I don't want to start it as soon as it's surfaced and it's down straight away, bang. Because, I'm, because it's not fishing at that point. And I'll be calculating time between fishing correctly. You've got to take into account disturbance on tip. It's all about just finding that time frame between fish. And it's that that tells you their feeding pattern. Oh, there we go. Don't feel a big fish. But it's fish on. Might just be a small roach, I think. Nice positive bite, though. And even a small fish, I'm not getting no slack line. Just bring it rod back towards my fish, and then I'm, I'm just drawing back this way. Too attractive to a pike. Oh, it's a roach. There we go. Nice right, bonus fish, a good roach. One thing you don't catch on here a lot. A lot of roach. But he's a nice fish. Again, probably 10 out of fish in. Not a massive roach, but definitely a welcome one. Oh, squawking at me, that fish. Oh. Cast. Make my clip straight down to my rest. See, now I've come back a bit on that cast. I can actually relax my rod a bit on my rest. Reset your stopwatch as soon as it's live, like it is now, and get your stopwatch down. And then you can sit here and just tighten up all you need to with your reel handle. Hey, good pal. You're in a few, mate, yeah. Good. Wet windmill is. Yeah, yeah. What, what you call turbine? Turbine. Just yeah. to right of that, you should be egg repulsed. So 20 minutes in, I'm going to draw this one back in. Just Fire it out again. Cast. Beautiful. Reset my watch, start it straight away. Now it's fishing. I want to be starting my watch, stopwatch straight away. Right. So I've had a drop back bite, I think. Yep. And we're in. So a lovely drop back bite. 10 minutes in that one. I'm gonna chuck some lids on me. Pinkies. For a funny feeling. We're about to get wet. Probably another skimmer. So as you can see, weather changed in an absolute flash uh, but switching to that double white maggot it has brought a fish on straight away I think it were six minutes in I had a drop back I lifted up and it was fish on straight away so just going to see if this uh, rain dies off a bit and I'll resume. it looks like it's going to brighten up anyway so just a minute while it's like this it's not worth getting camera wet so Come back a bit. I've seen the rod from here. Let's see if we can get any more. But I'll be back soon anyway. Small line bite then. Rod back a little bit. Another bite then. Fish on. Yeah, that's on. So, 
just coming up to eight minutes in on that cast. So everything's working to plan so far, everything's going quite well. Fish catch rate is quite scattered. Early fish, waiting long for fish. That one came in, I think it was under 10 minutes, that last one. So, um, 20 minute maximum. I've called them 20 minute fish. But normally I like them to be coming in the same sort of window, towards that 20 minute mark. But, it's not all bad. Like that, you can see the everything when it comes to confidence and peace of mind. So, I'm pretty there, yeah. get tackled up, you get a good picture of the controlling fish. So. Right, ladies and gentlemen, that is 52 pound a bream. I've put them in two nets, so I'm not banging loads of fish on top of each other. 
But all I've done is, I've used Revolution Baits GG Green and Skimmer and Bream Dark. I have two parts to one it, so two parts GG Green to one part Skimmer and Bream Dark. All I've done is, I fish double red, double white maggot on hook, not dead, alive, a few pinkies it mix. I've also put in a few maggots, and towards the end of the session, just a couple of casters in my mix as well. Uh, and a few little beef. Really easy fishing, very simple feeder tactics, and definitely one that you should get up and try soon. So, for the full range of baits available, for what I've caught these fish with today, head over to Revolution Baits Facebook page or their site, and you can buy everything from there for a good day's fishing. If you me very good, I'll do another debrief later on. But that is enough from me. Thank you for watching. Right, so you're probably aware that that was a very windy day and even with microphones right next to my mouth it was very difficult um, to hear a lot of it back so I do apologise. There will no doubt be another time I come up here in the next couple of weeks, might even be this week, and do it again. But yesterday Tommy Pickering was on that very peg on peg one on the south bank as they call it. And in the uh, in Spring League match, and he won it with 50 odd pound of bream. It's not uncommon to do 80 pound, 90 pound, 100 pound of bream on them woodside pegs. And my point has always been why does it always fish so well up there? One, it's a bigger expanse of water on that side at Reservoir. So. <sighs> Does it mean there's going to be more fish? Yeah, probably. Does it mean they're going to be bigger? Yeah, probably. But also, you've got an inlet right next to those pegs. Down here, on this side at Res, on what they call the East Bank, there's an inlet here as well, but it's half the depth. Over where I've been, you could walk across that inlet, no problem. But the water today has fluctuated five or six inches at a time, whilst boats have been going past, uh, rain, wind. So... I think it's easier for fish to migrate out to Aaron Calder Canal, which runs parallel to the reservoir, into that side of uh, Res. Whereas down here, where it's a lot shallower, I don't think it's as easy. Therefore, it would make sense for more fish to be in there. Now, in this part at Res down here, it's quite contained. There's a partition between this side and the big part at res, straight across the middle. And from what I've just been told, there used to be pegs on it, you used to be able to fish it. Now, water does meet over it, but it's not deep enough for fish to migrate over into each side. Not big fish anyway, like these big bream. So, my theory is that when we have heavy rain, water levels rise, it's easier for those fish to get into that side at res up there. That's why they're in bigger numbers, catch rates a lot higher. Um, and it's a, it's a larger part at res. So the fish that do get in there, there's, there's obviously more feed, more, more food in there for them. In here, it's a more contained area. So the fish that are in here, they're gonna be sort of resident fish. They're gonna feed heavily. I don't know, there's a lot of factors to take into account, but I think you really have to be here to see it. If you Google map it, you'll understand my theory. You've got fish that migrate straight out of the New Junction Canal and down the Aaron Calder, and their first opening for the reservoir is at that very point where they meet, which is also, any junction on canals is also a great fish holding spot. So fish can go in there really easily. If any fish travel any further past that, down this bit of air and colder beside me here, they're then going to get to this opening, which is next to Car Park at Southfield Reservoir. If they then can't get in that bit because it's too shallow, are they going to go back upstream and go into the big bit? I don't think they will. I think they just carry on downstream on air and colder. I don't think it would make a massive difference 
to make them want to travel back upstream. I don't think fish think like that. I really don't. So, that's my theory. The fish that come out at New Junction Canal and the Aaron Calder migrate straight into the larger part of the reservoir. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. That's my theory. If I was to say that theory without knowing the fish stocks, if I then went and fished it and then caught loads more up there, a bigger size fish than what's in this part down here, then I'd definitely convince myself. So that's the theory I'm going with. But anyway, I'm back in car now. I'm about to head off home. I've done, uh, it was £53.2 and the sling that I weighed the fish in was just under a pound. So I've called it £52.2 or £52 a bream. They've all been pretty much the same size. I think I've only had one that we'd probably call a skimmer. I know what northerners call six ounce skimmers bream. Um, I've had a rud and I've also had a nice roach, about 12 ounce as well. So a good day's fishing in all. Um, after Tommy did well on it yesterday, I was dying to get up here today and jump on that peg just to have a go. And yeah, it's brilliant. Not a great learning curve if you want to know how to fish Southfield Reservoir because there's only 10 pegs up there that you draw. The rest of them are down here on this east bank and it goes up to 70s, 80s, I believe, up there. So the odds are you're going to end up on one of these pegs down here. So, yeah, worth a visit. The DDAA book is 30 quid for year. Then you can get a Canal and River Trust key off the Canal and River Trust website, which is about seven quid with a few quid postage. Call it 50 quid, yeah, for a bit of travelling to get your book and a key, having it delivered through post for free. You get Southfield Reservoir, Aaron Calder Canal, River Don, New Junction Canal, and you don't just get a little bit of each either. You either get a lot of some or the entirety of the other. It's an absolute bargain for the year. So anyone thinking of getting it a go, definitely go and buy it. Put it on Facebook, ask the question. Loads of tackle shops are, will, will respond saying they've got the books in stock. Um, but today, to conclude the session, Revolution Baits GG Green, two parts to one, Skimmer and Bream Dark. Normally it's two parts to one, Skimmer and Bream Dark, GG Green, but starting to warm up a bit, there's a lot more colour going into water. I don't need a nice dark mix to keep the fish down and spook them off. A lot of colour in water so I can brine it up a little bit. All I've done is, I've made a mix, I've put some... Um, little bees seen up micros in it from Revolution Baits as well. I've then put in just a slack handful of maggots, a slack handful of pinkies, um, and get it a good mix. And I've been using a small window feeder at 35 meter. After a few hours, it started to die down a bit, and I was chucking at 20 minute casts. What I've done is I've dropped it down to 10 minute casts and put on an XL cage window feeder. So I'm putting double the bait in at double the speed. After a bit, probably about 30 minutes, I started getting my first bite. I was getting loads of liners again. Fish had moved back into area. It, even if they're just passing fish, it kept them there. A um, couple of minutes for a fish, nine minutes for another. On a couple of casts, especially one of them, I think it was 23 seconds. Put the rod down and I'm quick to get on my stopwatch as well. Very quick. 23 seconds and it will fish on. So without a doubt... That mix I use, and it's not just here, it's all the venues I fish for skimmers and bream. It absolutely empties places. It's brilliant. So, revolutionbaits.com, get on their website. Free delivery on orders over 50 quid. They've got a massive range of ground baits. Um, if you're going to get it, if you want it in one kilo, get it in one kilo. If you want to try it, but by all means, I, I can't stress it enough, get it in the five kilo bags because what you get for your money. It's an absolute bargain compared to a two kilo bag of ground bait it shot from another brand. You can Sometimes you can talk nine quid, 10, 11, 12 quid just for two kilos of some ground bait out there. And yeah, it might be great and you might swear by it, but this stuff has not failed me yet and you just cannot get enough for the money. It's amazing stuff. Um, not added any additives in it today. I've just kept it quite plain, nice and simple. Reflow power. Um, 013 to a size 14 hook really simple light fishing nothing too heavy and yeah it's been fisher chuck just about went through a quiet spell where not much happened um 
but that's just fishing that happens anywhere it's the best of us on easiest of places so i thought i'd finish video off in car because it's still blowing an absolute gale outside so apologies for the video who knows there's probably a microphone out there i can have glue to my cheek so you can hear me um or i'll even get like a britney spears headset on or something i don't know what i'll do next but definitely get some uh some of the mixes from revolution baits and give it a try it's amazing um you will not you will not be disappointed uh, and just i added a few casters in it last hour as well i notice a lot wherever i go my fishing tends to change in the last hour and a half two hour so i was doing quite well up to the last hour so what i did were i just got an handful of casters put them in mix and mixed it in that way if fish they sort of come in spells if for a good couple of hours that same shoal of fish are feeding that same shoal of fish are going to be watching fish get tugged out of that swim. They're going to notice that things are changing. So if I, if anything's going to change for the fish, I want it to be what they're eating. So they might think, oh God, there goes another one of my pals getting dragged out of my swim. Oh, but there's a few casters here now. They weren't there before. I'm going to confuse them a little bit more. It, just a theory. It sounds mental. It sounds crazy when you say it out loud as well. But up until end... I was getting fishy chuck. So 52 pound of bream. I did four hours and about 53 minutes fishing and started packing up. I always try and give myself that match time scale, five or six hours. One, it's safer on fishing a keep net where keep nets are allowed. And two, I get a more accurate response when I'm fishing a pleasure session. I don't want to come and do six o'clock in the morning until two in the afternoon. Um because I'm getting all wrong results. I'm not learning anything i'm not i'm not gaining any information what i need i might still catch but i'm catching them all at wrong times a day so thank you very much for watching remember to like and subscribe um apologies for not being very mobile i've got a knackered back it's absolutely destroying me and i don't do sympathy votes or anything like that I'm, the doctors give me painkillers for my back and it works an absolute treat they give me the same ones every week and for some reason, some some weeks just tend to work a lot better than others. Some weeks, it's like I've not even took any. They don't do anything. Um, I used to do a, long, a lot of a lot of biking. I used to do a lot of walking. I used to do loads of running. Uh, six foot two, 33 years old, with a knackered back. So it is a chore getting to my peg. But when I'm sat down for six hours at a time, I can do a lot more fizz just at home, pottering around the house, cleaning up, tidying up, running after the kids. Like I mowed lawn the other day, and I'd happily push my tackle around Southfield Reservoir for 20, 20 times to save me pushing a mower around my little guard. It's absolutely killing me. So I do apologise as well if it looks like I'm an absolute cripple. So thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next one, and um, hopefully next time we'll have a bit better weather. Thank you.